So, hi everyone. I hope uh, everyone's doing well and their families are doing well and healthy. Today, Adam and I are going to be discussing um, the COVID-19 numbers. So, we specifically focused on the U.S. number of cases and deaths with some global considerations and how accurate they are. Uh, but first, we want to take a brief moment to honor those who've been impacted by COVID-19 especially frontline workers like nurses, doctors, and grocery workers. We really thank them for putting their lives on the line every day. So as of this morning, there are a little over 2 million cases in the U.S. And there are 100, um, 100, 112,472 deaths in the United States. The question we ask today is, are, do these numbers reflect everyone who was diagnosed with COVID-19? And the short answer is no. Uh, these numbers are estimates, and this appears to be the case with most data of death etiology and disease data. Many researchers um, strongly assert the COVID-19 data underestimates the number of cases and deaths due to COVID in the US and in the globe. Uh, but in the U.S., this is probably due to issues with decision-making at the individual and state level, such as slow rollout of testing and issues with accuracy of the tests themselves, as we talked about before. Uh, the close to true numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths, arguably, and will most likely not be found until statisticians and epidemiologists have all the data concerning the pandemic, and this will take an extraordinary amount of time. So today, today we're going to be looking at these issues um, closely. First, we're going to have a brief overview of COVID-19, um, its issues, its history. Uh, then we're going to, um, we will follow the chain of decision making, um, kind of this described earlier in this lecture about each stage of testing, the decision to get a test, how people decide to get a test, and you know issues accessing that test. It, when you get a test, is the test accurate? Then we are going to um, plunge into the cause of death data. Um, we're going to look at pneumonia deaths and um, deaths due to COVID that have been reported and do some data analysis. Okay, so before we get into it, um, I thought it was important to kind of just reconvene and understand the timeline of the virus. So on December 31st, you start getting reports of clusters of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. So from that point, we can see all the way up to January 20th, 2020, the CDC confirmed the first COVID-19 case in the United States. Um, we eventually get to, you know, beginning of March of the February, February 29th, we can see that the, the FDA permitted immediate use of laboratory validated tests. So. You can see from this initial report in, in China, the cluster of pneumonia, which eventually were found out to be um, COVID-19 cases, you can see that there's a large, there's a, about two months where there's really not any testing in the United States. And we know that the first case was confirmed on January 20th. And just from um, you know common knowledge, we know that the incubation period for the, the virus is about one to two weeks. So if that person was tested positive on January 20th, expect that there was around, you know, the virus in the United States a week or two weeks before. Um, in March, testing really ramped up. Um, you started trying to, you know, companies tried to create more tests, different tests, more accurate tests. Um, and then today, there's over 19 million tests conducted in the United States, and this may seem like a substantial number, but it actually just comes out to roughly right under 6% um, of the U.S. population. So, this is a key question to think about, and I think you get what we're going for here. Um, if you had a cold, you know, how soon would you go to a doctor? Because it ends up being a very similar rationale when you start talking about COVID-19. So there's a couple of reasons why someone would not want to get a COVID-19 case, uh, COVID-19 COVID um, test. So we can see that um, on this article by CNN, posted um, the study that Iceland found that 50% COVID-19 cases have no symptoms at all. So one person may not go and get a COVID-19 test because they're, they're asymptomatic. 
mean they don't have case, they don't have symptoms, but they have the virus. Um, they may not just have it, so they might not get a test. They might think they have another illness. Um, they might think they have a common, you know, common flu or just a, a mild cold, mild long, long cold. Or they just don't want to. There could be political reasons. They may not think, you know, the virus is actually a real thing. Or they could just be, be fearful. They don't want to go um, and get tested because they think that maybe they'll get infected by someone else if they go. So, um, just briefly, when someone would want to get a test, uh, they may have symptoms related to COVID-19. They're fearful. They want to do it as a precautionary measure. Um, or they're an essential worker and it's required from their job. So that we walk through the decision-making process on, you know, do I want to get a test? And now we're going into, okay, I want to get a test. How can I get a test? Where can I get a test? So what this data is showing is that, you know, we're representing um, the light orange boxes. Light orange bars are the number of total daily tests. The dark orange is the number of positive tests. And the blue line is the moving average the seven day moving average of the positive test cases, the positive tests. Um, so it's interesting to, to note that the first case in the United States was announced on January 20th, 2020. Testing really started ramping up in that middle of March period. And this data um, starts on March 15th. So you can see that there's a wide, you know, just about two months, two and a half months where there's no data on anything um, COVID-19 related. Um, the red bar line going through the graph is the uh, when the majority of states issued stay-at-home orders. So, 31 states at this date of March 31st um, or before issued stay-at-home orders. And you can see that what's, that's what's interesting is that the number of positive cases, yes, it's a little higher in, in April, in the beginning of April. And it does go down a little bit in May, but it's relatively flat which is, you know, interesting to note that, you know, testing increased from March 29th to end of May about um, five times, and we're still getting the, the same amount of uh, positive cases, where um, in this time as well, when we started getting more testing data, more, you know, safety precautions that were, were in place by governments, such as mass social distancing um, and, you know, stay-at-home orders. So, a lot of the data is not being captured for the first two months, which is you know, one of the things that we want to point about the data. So what this chart is basically showing, and I'll just touch on this briefly, but it's basically showing the testing capacity per 1,000 people um, throughout each state in the United States. So you can see that there's a lot of variation. And as we mentioned before, less, less than 6% of the US population has been tested, have been tested. Um, and even New York and New Jersey, which were considered, you know, the hot spot of the virus, you can see that they're sitting at just around 50% of the people um, in their states, respectively, could get testing. Um, and then another thing interesting to note that Texas and Florida, you know, together, they represent about 20% of the U.S. population. And both of them, respectively, have the capacity for less than 50% um, of their citizens to get tested. So. It's just interesting to note. All right, so there are two common tests for COVID-19, but there are other types of tests um, that haven't been exactly well-researched and put into practice as much as these two. Um, like the Rutgers um, oral test we talked about before. The CDC currently recommends using NP swabs, um, which is the uncomfortable swab. They Put up your nose um and there are some challenges regarding this um the np swab test has a false negative rate of one fifth by day eight of being infected so at day one of being infected you have a hundred percent chance of getting a false negative and then by day eight researchers have figured out that you will get there's a 20 percent chance of getting a false negative um so one out of five people tested by the CDC recommended tests on average will test negative, um, but still have COVID-19 disease. Antibody tests um, have reported to have a 15% false negative rate, but due to the 
the slow rollout of testing and then the sudden push for testing, um, the accuracy of these false negative rates could differ substantially from the true false negative rates. Um, so to declare a... Uh, before you move on, I just want to um, ask everyone who's like, uh, who's not speaking, please mute yourself because we can hear some background noise here. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. So it's usually the case to declare a cause of death due to COVID. Nick, uh, Nick, can you go back to your last slide? I missed the tail end and I was very interested. Yes. Can you just talk about about uh, about the false negatives and etc. on the antibody test? Um, sure. So the, the NP swabs, researchers have found um, that they have an estimated that the probability of a false negative um, results using the most common nasal swab test decreases from 100% on day one of being infected and um, going in more detail to 67% on day four and then going to 20% on day eight. Um, so it really depends on time, uh, so you have to be infected longer, but 20% is a significant part. So that means one out of five people on average using the CDC recommended test will test negative, but still have COVID. Um, and the antibody test, there hasn't been a significant amount of research done and, um, there, uh, but it has been reported to have a 15% false negative rate. And also, it has a problem with um, a very high false positive rate um, between 83 to 69 percent in some of the first antibody tests. So clearly, as we go along, I'm sure that they're going to do research and get better. Um, yeah. But this is how the data was procured with these tests. That's what uh, struck me when you said that. That's a very high false positive rate. Wow. Um, so it definitely puts a lot of um, question marks with the data. Um, you're basically measuring um, with a faulty measurement system. So we felt that, that was a really significant statistic. So um, it is usually the case to declare a cause, a cause of death due to COVID. Um, you need a positive test to confirm that in most states, but now it seems that they're shifting to using um, probable COVID-19 deaths, but some states aren't on board with that. Um, so there's a lot of discrepancy in the data, and we'll get into that. But what can go wrong with um, counting deaths? Some died before a test was even made available. We talked about that, how there was a slow rollout of testing. Um, some of those who died did not have access to a test due to socioeconomic and or political reasons, such as lack of health care. Um, I know uh, if you don't have health care, um, you can purchase a test. You can actually get an antibody test. You can look up on Quest Diagnostic, Diagnostics, and you'll see the price there is $119. And perhaps for some of you, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, um, or maybe it does, uh, but a lot of people can't afford that. And so that's a, that to me. My, that's my daughter in Wyoming, my daughter in Wyoming just bought tests, 300 bucks. It's, it's amazing. Um, to me, something so important, <laughs> even though the, the difficulties with the accuracy, um, it should be less money, in my opinion. Um, but anyways, <laughs> some of those who died did not have access to it. Um, some of those who died had COVID-19, but had a false negative. We went over that. Um, and that leads into some of those uh, were misdiagnosed with other illnesses and diseases. Um, and we're going to go into that, you know, some just are declared to die of pneumonia. Um, and we'll get into that in another slide. Some were just miscounted due to administrative and miscellaneous reasons. And the next slide. So here. The, the key administrative problems with the COVID death counts, um, and this is something I found interesting, is that uh, death certificates do take time to be completed. There are many st steps to filling out and submitting the death certificates. Waiting for test results can d 
just create additional delays, additional error. Some um, states uh, report at different rates. Uh, I believe it's 63% of all deaths are reported within 10 days, um, but there's significant variation among states. Uh, some deaths by COVID must be coded in person, uh, which I find interesting. Um, I read an article that some doctors are hesitant to uh, uh, participate in the diagnostic process with um, people who died of COVID because of fear of infection. So it creates additional problems, additional error in the accuracy of the numbers. And there are many different reporting systems um, from what it seems like for counting COVID-19 deaths. Some, uh, like some states have been incorporating probable deaths, but not all states have them. So uh, this graph was taken from the New York Times and it appears, well, it's shown that there has been an increase in the typical expected amount of deaths in other illnesses in the past month. And public health experts claim that these numbers, they're asserting these numbers are a result from undercounting or misdiagnosing COVID-19 numbers, or just indirectly linked to the pandemic overall. But it's interesting to know, um, it's hard to see on this screen, but like um, flu and other respiratory diseases leaves 5% increase compared to the uh, expected amount of deaths in this time period. Um, so some deaths are can be diagnosed um, as caused by other respiratory illnesses due to similarities of symptoms like pneumonia. Uh, so that's just something really interesting that we're going to get into in the next slide. So I had a little bit of fun doing this um, because I took the data from the CDC uh, just because I really wanted to see it with my own eyes. Uh, so I took the number of deaths per week due to pneumonia, COVID, and um, COVID and pneumonia, so COVID-induced pneumonia. And what I found really interesting was that the distributions of COVID-19 deaths and strictly pneumonia deaths between February 1st and the end of May are very similar. Uh, and I thought this was really startling. They really do um, follow each other, and this may suggest a relationship. Uh, it also may suggest deaths due to pneumonia have been misdiagnosed. Um, COVID-19 can cause pneumonia, which is inflammation of the tissue of the lungs for those who aren't aware. But pneumonia can stand by itself as a cause of a death. It can be caused by a whole host of things from bacterial to viral or fungi, um, my, microbes, and it, it can really be caused by a lot of diseases. So it's a very complex diagnostic. Yeah, and it just kind of reinforced that idea. It's, it's, I found this very fascinating because when you start looking at um the deaths the coronavirus deaths in red and then you look at the pneumonia deaths in purple they basically start upticking over their you know the average of pneumonia deaths starts going up at the same point that COVID 19 deaths start taking up so it's it's just very interesting it's, it, it looks it looks um you know that we could possibly have, hypothesize that there is some sort of a uh, bigger correlation than that's being reported so and so, so I was thinking, well, is, is there a correlation? And obviously more statistical analysis needs to be done on this. But I was trying, I was analyzing the misdiagnosis of pneumonia. And I wanted to see if there was a positive correlation between the increase in deaths per week of COVID and the number of deaths due to pneumonia each week. What I found is a largely positive, positively correlated um, a line here. Um, it seems that, you know, if you look at the R squared value, it, it's 0.87. So 87% of the variation in COVID-19 um, deaths appears to be reduced by taking into account pneumonia deaths. And to get an 87%, I thought this was really significant. It's really high and close to one. Um, very strange to me. Um, these th death counts appear not to be independent. Um, to me, that suggests errors in diagnosis, um, but more statistical analysis is necessary. Obviously, there's inference that needs to be done here. 
This data was taken from the CDC um, in the National Center of Health Statistics. Yeah, and just, just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm briefly going to touch on this, um, but I thought this was something interesting. So the New York Times basically uh, put this graph together, and what it's representing is they took the normal numbers of number of deaths, um, you know, the expected number of deaths per year, um, and started looking at, you know, when is it above or below the mean? So excess deaths is basically measuring the number of deaths greater than what was typically expected in a given week in this case. Um, below is, is in that bluish gray and above is in orange. And which is, what is very interesting is that once you get into March, into April, you can start seeing that uptick in the, in the orange bars shoot up. Um, and as we know, that's when the virus really started taking its toll on, you know, the U.S. specifically, um, but around the world as well. So you can see the COVID-19 deaths reported in that red line. And even though, um, you know, it, they are pretty high up that excess death bar, um, there's still substantial deaths that are taking place in excess of the COVID-19 deaths. So it was just something interesting that we wanted to, uh, you know, touch on. There's uh, global considerations. So much of the conversation we had was resulting you know, in the data in the U.S., uh, but we briefly want to touch on the COVID-19 reporting done around the world. So there's a lot of variation in COVID-19 reporting around the world, whereas, you know, the standards of reporting may be different um, or simply, you know, they may not have the same countries may not have enough tests in different regions. So there's a lot of variation in, in to getting that accurate number because not everyone's giving the same amount of tests. Um, not every population is the same. So it's, it's very interesting. And I know we touched on this before in the lecture, but, um, you know, there's a lot of been, there's been a lot of public scrutiny, scrutiny um, and hypothesis that, you know, the numbers coming from China may not be accurate. Um, so that's another thing that we don't really know the true number of people that may have the virus. Um, and then a lot of de developing nations may not have the resources such as, you know, the United States, uh, for example. I know in Africa, they, there's been reports where a lot of the countries in Africa are seeing upticks in the virus, um, but they just simply don't have the same amount of resources that we do to get the test um, and, you know, also fight off the virus, which is, you know, a downside. Uh, I just want to add something. Oh, sorry, Adam. No, you can go ahead. Uh, I, I think, like, you know, this is a, a big moment for, because I know that globalization has been, you know, under a microscope when you're talking about the COVID pandemic and how it, whether it's going to hinder globalization or it's going to help globalization. Well, I think that this is a chance that we really could um, uniform the practice of recording information about health statistics and deaths. That way we can um, better make, all collectively make decisions as a global nation, if you will. Um, and this is really a chance to really, so I, I've noticed in the readings, there's a lot of uh, talk about how there's issues with data transferring from doctor to doctor. I can't imagine this data transferring from country to country and you know not having error, not being measured differently. So I think this is a wake up call that Perhaps globalization is the best way to move forward to help deal with pandemics like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the only thing, other thing I was going to add was the the image on the right that you see. Um, that's the massive graveyard that's being built in Brazil just to keep the keep up with the um, you know sheer capacity of people that are dying from the virus. So um, it's just an important thing to note about there. This is affecting obviously globally everyone. So just to wrap this up, um, we kind of walk you through the process of the rationale in a person in this day and age, one of us, um, you first decide, you know, do I want to get the test? And then you move on to, if I want to get the test, is it available? And then you get your test results back. So we saw in the desire to get the test, you know, there, there are a lot of people that aren't getting the test, you know, they either think they don't have the virus, they're asymptomatic, um, they believe they have another illness, or they just simply just don't want to get the test, regardless of their situation. And then we also saw there's a lot of availability. There's not that much availability to get this test. So um, availability is, it really depends on where you are in the country. Um, and even then, it's not 100%. And, you know, the means to get a test are still challenging. You know, 
Um, and antibody tests, they're still requiring payment without um, a prescription. And then test results. We saw that, you know, test results are not as accurate as we thought. Um, we saw 20% of positive COVID-19 uh, patients and testing negative when taking the COVID-19 um, test. And we also saw that in the death rate, um, in the death analysis, it takes a long time to get this data. So just in conclusion, we, we really believe that the numbers uh, reported in the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic are underrepresented in the data. And so these are the sources. This is very interesting. This is a great presentation. Thank you.